Say, this is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It has the power to change my life and to give me an inheritance amongst the saints. I'm not a hearer only, but I'm a doer of the Word. Wave your Bible at me and shout hallelujah. Look and take your, ple- your seat, please, in the presence of the Lord. This month, may God visit you. May it be your month of great things. May you have cause to celebrate and rejoice throughout the month. May God lift you from glory to glory. May his favor be your portion. In Jesus' name, give the Lord an amen. This is our month of the anointing. And we are looking at the anointing. The anointing we established last week is the power of the Holy Spirit. We also established that the anointing is the flow of God's power in our lives. The anointing guarantees our success. The anointing grants us tangible impact. and The anointing is the power of God to give us tangible results. If you are ready for the word of God today, lift up one hand, let's share a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it's time to declare your word. Your word is already anointed. I ask that you anoint these lips of clay. Grant me utterance. Make me a blessing to your people. In Jesus' name, and will the saints say amen. We want to continue talking on the anointing. When we talk about the anointing, there are three types, three major types of anointing. We have the individual believer's anointing. We have the anointing on the fivefold ministry, and we have what we call the corporate anointing. When we talk about the individual believer's anointing, Jesus in John chapter 4 was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, and he said to her in John 4 verse 13, he said, there is water that I can give you to drink, and when you drink this water, this water shall be in you a well of water springing up to everlasting life. Jesus here was talking about salvation or being born again or getting to know him. When you get to know Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you. We call that the anointing within. In fact, when we talk about the Holy Spirit coming to live inside you, when until Jesus died and rose from the dead, nobody could ever be born again. Every one of the disciples who walked with Jesus, whilst they walked with Jesus, none of them was born again. Because until anybody could be born again, Jesus had to go to the cross. He had to go to the cross and die and come back again. He had to be reborn or resurrect from the dead. That is when anybody could be born again. So after he died and resurrected, To get the disciples born again, in John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus appeared to the disciples. And when he appeared to them, the scripture says, he breathed on them and said to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. When he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost, what happened was that immediately those disciples were transformed or they were born again. The anointing came to live inside them say the anointing came to live inside them. So that is the anointing within. But there is also what we call the anointing upon you. Jesus in John was still talking about the Holy Spirit when he said in John chapter 7 and verse 38, John chapter 7 verse 38, he was talking, he said, he that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then the verse 39 says, this he was speaking of the Holy Spirit that those who believe on him will receive because Jesus was not yet glorified. If you are here with me, give me an amen. So Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus had mentioned two different things. The first one was a well of water springing to everlasting life or eternal life Everlasting life or eternal life is the God kind of life. 
Amen? So Jesus was saying, when you receive me, when you drink of me, and Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 says, Ho, oh, he who is thirsty, come to me, drink of the waters of life. So Jesus was saying, when you come to me and I give you the waters of life, you become born again, it becomes a well in you. But that well, at a certain point, that same Holy Spirit you have received, that same Holy Spirit must come out of you as rivers of living water, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is the second stage of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. However, the anointing, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, what happens is that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, the Bible says, For we have received an unction. Amen? We have received an unction from the Holy One, and we know all things. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you, you have received an unction. This word unction means anointing. It means being rubbed on. Amen? It's, it's, it's a term used in biblical terms, me medically, to mean that somebody goes to the hospital, he's massaged with oil, or they rub oil on him, it's unction. Amen. This month, except God helps you to run through your troop and leap over your walls, you are not going to let him go. Unless your story is changed, unless God does a new thing in your life, unless he lifts you up where you belong, you are not just going to let him go. It is your month and you will not give up until you have prayed through and broken through. Join us for an all-night service on the 20th of October at 10 p.m at the Perez Dome, Jonglo Junction, Accra. Let's come prepared to experience the supernatural touch of God. In fact, that is what, how the Bible dictionary describes unction. And Miriam Webster's dictionary, also one of the meanings it gives about unction is uh, medicinal rubbing on or medical rubbing on with oil. Now the Bible says we have an unction. The purpose of this unction that we have received according to 1 John 2 verse 26 is so that we will not be deceived. So that we will not be deceived. In 1 John 2 26 it says these things have I written unto you Concerning them that seduce you or them that deceive you. Verse 27, it says that anointing you have received which is within you teaches you all things so that you don't need that any man will teach you. Now, what, what the scripture is saying is that the anointing we receive when we receive Jesus as Lord and personal Savior, the purpose of that anointing is so that we cannot be deceived. Because when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said to them, in the last days, there will be false prophets, false apostles, and false Christ. And if it were possible, they will deceive the elect. That means that it's not possible. Why is it not possible? Because 1 John 2, 27, you have received an anointing which is within you. Tell somebody sitting by you, you have received an anointing which is within you. Now, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 11, the Bible says now, when Jesus ascended up into heaven, he gave gifts of men, or he gave gifts unto men. Now, the rendition is he gave gifts of men unto us. You know, but it's the same thing. He gave gifts unto men, some apostles. Now, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, they are gifts of men to the church. But the purpose for which he gave them, verse 11, is so that the saints will be equipped or perfected, so that the saints will be helped to be perfected, so that they will do the work of Christian ministry, so that they will be edified or grow up or be built up. Verse 13, can you give me verse 13? He says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Continue unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, God wants us to get to the place where we look like Jesus. We are not like Jesus yet. 
Uh, I said we are not like Jesus yet. The Bible says when he appears, we shall be like him. Amen? Because, Charlie, you know the kind of things, some things. If God is to show everything you have been doing, say you know. Amen? You are not like Jesus yet. Tell somebody sitting by you are not like Jesus yet. When nobody is watching, the way you get annoyed, the way you blast your husband, the way you insult your wife, your friends, the way you have been reacting to them, how you react in the office, all those things. But the joy of it is that God gave us the fivefold ministry to work on us so that God will perfect that which concerns us. That is why there are times you come to church and the preaching there, phew, the preaching rubs off on you. It, may, it, it, feels like the, it feels like somebody went and reported you to the bishop. Nobody reported you to the bishop. The Holy Spirit reported you to the bishop or reported you to the preacher so that you will be worked on. Amen? So that you come to a place where you are a perfect man. But then in the verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 4, give me verse 14, uh, uh, the King James first. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now he's talking about pastors. He's talking about apostles, prophets, evangelists. However, he's saying that there are many people in the church who are tossed to and fro and carried by every wind of doctrine. There are different winds of doctrine. Amen? Every season and the kind of wind that blows. And the problem is that there are some Christians who are children, but he doesn't want us to remain children anymore. He wants us to be matured. He doesn't want us to be carried to and fro, fro and blown by every wind of doctrine. That means that you hear Apostle Kakarika, it's in the wilderness, you go there. You hear Prophet Kokoriko, it's in the valley, you go there. You hear Bishop Ma Masayaba, it's there, you go there. No, 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 that is not what he wants you to do. And, and, and what happens is that the Bible is saying that there are di different winds of doctrine and slight of men and cunning craftiness. That means that there are pastors and people who are supposed to be pastors who are cunning, crafty, and use trickery. That is what the Bible is saying. Let's take it from, and their purpose is to deceive. And so you can be deceived as a child of God if you are not grounded. If you keep moving from place to place, and there are so many Christians who are moving from place to place, anything they hear, they go there. They are drinking brown water and green one. They, they are rubbing blue anointing oil and rubbing red one. They are telling them that if it's not your father, it is your grandmother. If it is not your grandmother, it is your child. And somebody said, a lot of the times, the people they call are all poor people. I've never seen any rich man in, your, in anybody's family being called a witch or a wizard before. Every time the people who are witches and wizards are all... Amen. <laughs> but let's look at the Amplified, the verse 14 of the Amplified. It says, it says, So then we may no longer be children tossed like sheep to and fro between chance gusts of teaching and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine. We are not supposed to waver. We are supposed to be rooted and established, grounded in him. The prey of the cunning, continue, the prey of the cunning, oh, continue with me, my friend. Still the verse 14, you haven't finished the verse 14. The prayer of the cunning craftiness of unscrupulous men. Now he's talking about preachers here. And he says some are clever and unscrupulous. And he says that gamblers engage in every shifting form of trickery in inventing errors to mislead. They invent errors to mislead. One time I was watching so-called pastor who said he was commanding passport to come. It was like magic. <laughs> Trickery. I mean, God doesn't work like that. God doesn't behave like that. Amen? But the Bible is, <laughs> the Bible is saying that the cleverness of unscrupulous men in every shifting form of trickery in inventing errors.
errors and the purpose is to mislead in the saints. Now, that is the reason why God gave you the anointing within so that the anointing within will teach you when somebody is doing something that is not genuine, the Bible says the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of the children of God. May you be led by the Spirit of God. Give him praise. Now, if you are going to be led by the Spirit of God, then you have got to learn to listen to the anointing within. You've got to learn to listen to the anointing within. Tell somebody, learn to listen to the anointing within. So it's not enough to just come to church. No, the, most, the, the, the important thing here is that if you are going to listen to the anointing within, the Holy Spirit inside you will always use the Word of God you have stored inside you. So you must read the word of God for yourself. Tell somebody sitting by you, read the word of God for yourself. Tell another person, read the word of God for yourself. In John chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 26, my Bible says, John 14, 26, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, but the comforter who is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance what he has said, what Jesus has said to you. How do you know what Jesus said? It's by reading the word of God. Tell somebody, read the word of God. Tell another person, read the word of God. So for you as a child of God, you must be a student of the word. The Bible says about the saints in Berea, the Christians in Berea, they were different from other Christians. And the reason why they were different was because the Bible says after Paul had preached, they would also go home and search the scriptures to see whether the things he said were truly in the scriptures. Don't just take it that because a man of God said it, it is from God. If a man of God said it and it's not in line with the word of God, you don't accept it. Now, when I got saved and I was learning from the anointing within, the Holy Spirit had to show me how to learn. He had to teach me from the anointing within. I went to a meeting, young believer. But those days, I had, I, I, when, when I got saved, I just started, I plunged myself into studying the Bible. In fact, as a young believer, I was reading at least 20 chapters of Bible every day. And I used to go to bed about 12, 12 midnight. And I woke up in the morning about 4 a.m. To serve, to serve in the mission house. I would read at least 20 chapters of Bible. I will read five chapters in the Psalms, one chapter in the book of Proverbs. I will read five Old Testament chapters. I will read five gospel chapters. I will read five epistles. And at times, I will read five Acts of the Apostles because I wanted the power in the Acts of the Apostles. And I went to this church, this fellowship. And in, in the fellowship, the, the, the very anointed man of God. In fact, those days, the government of, of Ghana in the early days of the revolution gave him the uh, 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 holy gardens. Holy gardens that three years he should build a church on. If he doesn't build a church, the government will take it back. And, and, and he, he, he didn't build. Why? Because he stood in the church and I was sitting there and he said, let us pray prosperity. There's a doctrine of prosperity which is bad. Let us pray it out of the church. Now you, what you don't respect, you don't attract. The law of attraction tells you that you attract the, what you respect. Immediately he said that the anointing within me gave me a scripture. Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul is prospering. So everybody was praying against prosperity in the church. I was claiming prosperity. I didn't understand the doctrine of prosperity, but something inside me was telling me it was wrong not to like prosperity. The anointing within me, the anointing will teach you. Amen? Tell somebody the anointing will teach you. Then some people also met me and then they started telling me that tithing was Old Testament theology and New Testament bondage. 
Immediately they said, Titan was Old Testament theology, New Testament bondage. The anointing within me gave me scripture. Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14 by verse 18, the Bible says that then Abraham visited with Melchizedek after fighting Sodom and the people who fought Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham gave Melchizedek a fight of all that he had. And then the Bible says, Abraham was told by the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, take everything, take whatever you want. And Abraham said, I have lifted up my hands unto the most high God. That I will not anybody say that he made me rich but that God made me rich. Give the Lord praise. So the anointing within began to explain it, the anointing within. We use scripture to scripture that if Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, then there was no way tithes was, uh, was under the law because if it was under the law, the law came by Moses. And so tithe was paid before the law. Now, if tithe was paid before the law, and the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, curse this everyone that hangs on a tree. And verse 14 says, that the blessing of Abraham might be ours through Christ Jesus, that we might receive that promise through faith. So if the blessing of Abraham even though we are in the New Testament, but the Bible is saying that the blessing of Abraham might be ours, then it means that what Abraham did was not under the law. Amen? But you must know the scripture for the Holy Spirit to take the scripture to be able to work the scripture inside your spirit man. The anointing within will teach you all things. Tell somebody the anointing within will teach you all things. Oh, give him praise and give him thanks. The friends of Bishop Charles Ajinasari from around the world are just a click away right here on Facebook. Do not fall prey to the duplicate pages on Facebook using Bishop Charles Ajinasari's name and image. Simply look out for the blue verification tick next to his name which is one word and not hyphenated. This tick confirms that the Facebook page of Bishop Charles Ajinasari is verified. Follow the dynamic Bishop of Paris Chapel International, his posts, updates, and ministry. Watch out for the blue verification tick next to his name. Just a click away. I remember I sat in a meeting and this anointed man of God was teaching and he said that every Christian has a dual uh, 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 personality. That means you have, the, you have a, a, a nature of sin or a sinful nature and you have a spiritual nature or you have a Christ-like nature. Immediately the Holy Spirit told me that is the Holy Spirit quickened the scripture to me because when I got saved, now, for me, that doctrine was a very major doctrine. Bad one. Why? Because I used to live a life of sin. I was, I was bad before I met Jesus in 1980. And when I met Jesus and I went to tell my dad, my dad said, eh, hey, say you are born again. I said, yes, I'm born again. He said, what church did you, did you get born again? Then I told him the church. He said, oh, two weeks ago, I went to that church. I went for a wedding. Uh, I see. When I went, there were a lot of young, young girls in the church. I see. It's because of the young, young girls you say you are born again. I'm giving you six months. I know they will bring me at least three children. Three women you have been pregnant. So I, I went to God in prayer. I said, God, look at what my father is saying. I want you to prove to him. Give me, show me what to do to prove to this man that it is not so. And then the Holy Ghost led me to Romans chapter 6, verse 6. And Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says that we are crucified with Christ. If we are crucified with Christ, how shall we live any longer in sin? Now, like I told you, I was bad. Smoking, drinking, all kinds of things. 
when I got saved and I prayed that prayer after my dad said, the Holy Spirit asked me some questions. Uh, so, if you put cigarette the mouth of a, of a dead man, what will happen? I said, nothing will happen. He can't smoke it. What about if the man is dead and you put a woman, naked woman on him? He said, I said, nothing will happen. He said, then you are dead. You are dead in Christ. You are dead to sin. You are dead to sin. Amen? But the fact that you are dead to sin doesn't mean that you should be praying with people in, with, of the opposite sex in closed rooms and closed windows. Amen? You know, these days you can't even say opposite sex because these days men are getting attracted to men, women are getting attracted to women, and the LGBTQ, the, the queer, the, some are getting attracted to animals, so you don't even know which, you, what you say when you are logged in with alone, what will happen. Are you understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> but what I'm saying is that the fact that you are dead to sin does not mean that you should put yourself in situations that will compromise you. Amen? And so the scriptures, the scriptures, the anointing within began to teach me and show me that it must not be so. Listen to me. Another doctrine that they told me was that uh, 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 the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And so once you are born again, you can do whatever you like. And this time it was with my friends, a lot of young people who were growing up as young preachers coming together. They were saying, well, well the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. Most of all those who said that are nowhere to be found today in ministry. Why? Because even though the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance, you can take yourself out. When the devil misbehaved in heaven God sacked him I know you tell me that but we are in the New Testament well David said God take not thy free Holy Spirit from me and cast me not away from your presence you said that is Old Testament okay in my life next year I would be 35 years in a healing ministry and in full-time ministry January I'll be 35 years if the Lord 35 is a long give the Lord praise And to celebrate my 35 years in a healing ministry and in a miracle ministry, next January, I'm having my greatest crusade in the city of Accra. Hey. <laughs> yeah, because by the grace of God, the anointing that came upon my life 35 years ago has only gotten greater and better. Amen. In fact, I returned from Takwa yesterday and I left the meeting for Apostle Raymond to continue yesterday and today and on Friday night there was this lady they carried into the meeting deaf and dumb from birth and the power of God opened her ears and up and touched her tongue she began to speak and all of a sudden she started crying all over the place the power of God had touched her the anointing has been the same everywhere I have been in the 87 nations I have preached the anointing has been the same tonight if you are deaf in one ear deaf in both ears dumb a stammerer can you come out of your seat come to me in front here quickly how long have you been deaf in that ear eight years in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth I ask that this ear will pop open and I command healing into this ear in Jesus' name. Amen. Close this one. And say what I will say. Say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Now, mute my microphone for this one. Close. Amen. 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 Give the Lord praise. Give it to Jesus. Now, deaf and dumb spirit. Loose this young lady. Thou dumb tongue. Loose her in Jesus' name. Look at me. Ah. Ah. Oh. Amen. Amen. Ah, mm. ah, mm. oh, mm. amen, mm. amen, mm. amen. Mm. Give the Lord a mighty clap. Oh, give it to Jesus.
Oh, she's crying. Tears of joy. She's so happy. Put your hands together to the Lord. Give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Oh, give the Lord a mighty clap of this. I ask that this jaw will be loosed, the tongue will be loosed in Jesus' name. Amen. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is a new day. It's a new day. My life is transformed. Life is transformed. I'm, going I'm going back transformed. Back transformed. People, will see a difference People will see a difference in the way I talk. The way I talk. Give the Lord praise. Amen. Give him praise. Give him praise. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My life is never the same. My life is never the same. I am healed. I'm healed. I'm a testimony. I'm a testimony. Give the Lord praise. <laughs> Give him praise. But beloved, they said the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance, forgetting that when Satan misbehaved, God took that grace from him. Because in, in, in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible says, because you have hated iniquity and loved righteousness, the Lord your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Listen to me. If the oil of gladness is going to be on you above your fellows, then you must hate iniquity and love righteousness. If you are here with me, give the Lord an amen. Amen. No wonder last month God was preparing us by making us look at kingdom attitudes. He was preparing us to get rid of the attitudes that will stop the anointing from working in our lives. By the end of this month, may you receive a new anointing. Uh, your, 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 your amen needs a top up. I said by the end of this month, may you receive a new anointing and a greater anointing. Give him praise, give him praise, give him praise. Give him praise, give him praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. And so God, the anointing within, teaches us, makes us know. I remember I was attending this fellowship and this man of God said to us, he said, young men, stop desiring power. You young men, you like too much power. Ah. And I was sitting there and suddenly the anointing within said, Acts chapter 6, verse 8. The Bible says, and Stephen, a young man, full of faith and of power did great wonders and miracles amongst the people now if you are a young man and you don't desire the power of God God cannot use you amen and so the anointing within instead of me quitting desiring power there was more a desire for the power of God listen to me if there is anything you need as a young man and woman it is the power of God to make you effective it is the power of God to bring you to the cutting edge and make you a frontliner and make you a testimony in your generation give God praise give him thanks give him praise give him thanks give him praise Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says that and the son of God was declared in power according to the spirit of holiness. When I got saved, one of my favorite scriptures was Ecclesiastes 9 verse 8. It says, let your garments be always white and let your hair lack no ointment. If your, your garment in scripture represents your righteousness and your holiness, and there are times it also represents the anointing depending on the context. In this context, it is talking about your righteousness and your holiness. It says, let your garments be always white. Be spotless. Don't live in sin. Forsake sin. It says, when your garment is always white, then your head will lack no ointment. Ointment is the anointing, is the oil, is the power of God. If the power of God is continually going to be upon your head, you must walk in righteousness and in holiness. Give the Lord praise. Give him thanks. Give him praise. Give him thanks. You can't, you can't live in sin and expect a great anointing. Listen, I've had some people say, oh, you, you, you can do whatever you want. Uh, once you are saved, you are forever saved, so it doesn't matter. You can do, oh, for a season. For a season. It's like when you open a tap. When you, when you open a tap and the tap is flowing, when there's water from waterworks, you open. But when you close it, you see that the water keeps flowing ah, for a while before it stops. And that is what happens. A lot of the times when the Holy Spirit comes into the life of a person, he comes like a dam. 
He comes, boom. Everybody can see, but when the, whole, when the anointing is lifting, it lifts gently like a dove. People don't see it. Before you realize, the anointing is gone. That is what happened to Samson. Samson, the day he was shaved, because every time Samson had gotten used to the anointing, he knew some things he would do, and the anointing would be there. And next week, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the things we can do for the anointing to be there. But if you are not careful, you become professional. Because a professional is somebody who knows the principles and knows that when I apply these principles, I will get these results. He knows that as a pilot, when I do A, B, C, D, this is what I will get. As a doctor, if I do A, B, C, this is what I will get. And so if you are not careful, you become professional. But when it comes to the anointing, God never wants you to become professional. He never wants you to be used to him. Amen? Because he's doing new things all the time. And so that day they were shaving Samson's head. Samson said, let me shake myself as at other times. And the Bible says, and he wished not that the power had left him. And for some Christians, the Holy Spirit left them a long time ago. He left them six years ago. They haven't realized it. You remember that when Jesus went with his parents to the temple to pass his bar mitzvah, he was just 12 years old. His mother and his father left him in the temple. They went three days journey without realizing that Jesus was not with them. That was how familiar they had become with Jesus. And for some of us believers, we become so familiar with the presence and the power of God. When we come to church and it's worship time, we wouldn't worship because oh, eh, I don't like the people who are leading the choir. I don't like the sound. I don't like the feel of the music. And because I don't like the feel, and maybe that day, that was the day God had designed to meet you and to touch you. But because you don't like the feel, you become so, you become so used to the anointing. Next week, may God help us to work on ourselves. Because for a lot of us Christians, we are getting too professional in, in, in our service to God. We know that every Sunday, I have to take my Bible. And when I take my Bible, I come to church. There's a particular place I sit. And when you come and you don't get that place to sit, the whole of the service, you are doomed. And you moon your face. You are like the clouds are coming down. When the preacher even looks at you, the anointing wants to lift from him. Because the way you have squeezed your face, because you didn't sit at the place you normally sit, it's being professional. It's being professional. We, we, get, we get so used. The Bible says, and Samson did not wish that the anointing had lifted. He didn't know. Because every time he did some small things, he knew how to shake himself and the anointing will come. So a lot of us, we are, so, we are, so, we, we are getting very used to God. Tell somebody sitting by, don't get used to him. Tell another person, don't get familiar with the anointing. That was the problem with the family of Jesus and with the people in the hometown of Jesus. In Mark chapter 6, the Bible says in verse 5, Mark chapter 6, it says, and when Jesus, you see, you have to trace from Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus heals a madman. The madman at Gadara, he heals him. And then in the same Mark chapter 5, the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she was healed. Jairus' daughter, who was dead, was raised from the dead. And from Mark chapter 5, we just enter Mark chapter 6. In English, when they are talking and they say, and it means it's continuing the previous sentence. So the Bible says, and he went from doing all those three great miracles and came to his own country. And verse 5, verse 5 says, and he could then do no mighty work. Not that he did not want to do it. He couldn't do it. We are talking about Jesus. He couldn't do it. In his own hometown, he couldn't do it. He could do no mighty work. Save he laid hands upon a few sick folks and healed them. And verse 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about their villages teaching. Verse 7. And he called unto the twelve and began to send them two by two. Now, you know, you know, you know the people's problem. Their problem was, ah, is this not Jesus? The carpenter. 
and the capitessa. Are his brothers and sisters not here with us? When did he start growing? When my chair had a problem, I used to take, I used to call him and they didn't recognize when the anointing came on him and Jesus became another man. I came today to tell somebody by the end of this month, the anointing will come on you in a new way. New things will happen in your life. God will empower you to do exploits. Give him praise, give him thanks, give him praise, give him thanks, give him praise. You will see results like never before. Tell somebody you will see results like never before. They will say, see what the Lord has done. Amen. And so, as a young man, I desire power. You've got to desire the power of God. You need the power of God. This month is a month that if you can fast, fast. If you can pray, pray, pray more than you have been praying. Because by the end of this month, something must happen in your life. God must anoint you with fresh oil. Whatever you are doing, you must excel. You must be in the top bracket of whatever you are doing. Last week, we said that there were three kinds of callings. There is the general call unto salvation. There is the call into ministry that every, mini, every child of God must do. And there is the technical call, which is for your vocation. God must anoint whatever he has called you to do because that is his plan and purpose for your life. Amen. May this month be your month. Oh, you didn't, I said, may this month be your month. Amen. Tell somebody, may this month be your month. I, I, I will never forget. When I was in Tamale, one day there was this, there was this man who, who got saved, in, uh, who got healed in the church. He was almost dying. No? And then they carried him to the church. I ministered to him. The man got healed. He came a little while and then he stopped. After some months, I met the guy. And I said, Jafu, you are not coming to church again. He said, ah, man of God. He said, have you seen anybody? who is sick and goes to the hospital and after admission, he goes back to stay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I asked the Holy Spirit, Lord, if this is the situation, then the people are making this place a hospital, they won't stay. And the anointing within, quicken Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. He says, and I will give you pastors who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And so I realized that my first responsibility as a pastor was to feed the people with knowledge and understanding. That is when my ministry took a turn. I made it a point that Sunday after Sunday, I will be teaching and preaching the word of God. I will be teaching and preaching the word of God. And you see, I, I still have miracles. I still see miracles. But I don't make my Sunday church every Sunday miracles. I don't make it a prayer for me church. Because if I make it a prayer for me church, people will come to receive prayer and when they go, they won't come back. But if it's a place where the word of God is taught, everybody wants to grow in the knowledge of God. We want to, be perf we want to become perfect in the things of God. Some years ago, I was preaching for one of the prophets. And he said to me, he said, Bishop, we have been observing you. Because in this nation, we don't see any prophet that has a church Sunday attendance like your own. Our weekday attendance, we have so many people coming, but Sunday we don't have people. He said, why? I said, because your church is a pray for me church. People come and you prophesy to them. 
after you've prophesied to them for two years, they need to change church. Because if you are not careful, you will be recycling the prophecy. And so they look for another place. But there is something that doesn't change. And that is the unadulterated word of God. You can't keep teaching the unadulterated word of God and be short of information. Because the Bible says his mercies, they are new every morning. The word of God is like dew. They fall fresh every morning. I know that you have heard me teach on the anointing before. But I know that today you are seeing me in another level. Give the Lord praise. I'm magnifying my office. Amen. Give God praise. Give him praise. Give him thanks. Give him praise. So we have to teach the word of God. We have to teach the word of God. Because, you see, the greatest anointing is not the individual anointing. It's not the anointing on the pastors. It's the corporate anointing. The corporate anointing, when it's present... Hey, all kinds of things happen. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, when the corporate anointing fell, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, God, can you give me verse 13? 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13. The Bible says, And it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when the, they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercies endureth forever, that even the house was filled with a cloud. Even the house of the Lord, verse 14. It says, So that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. Listen, the people because they were one with one accord. And when the church comes to that place, that the instrumentalists, the singers, the choristers, the sound people, the projecting people, the screen people, the, the, we, we are all one, we are prepared, waiting on our ministry. Not when the preacher is preaching, then the meters and greeters are taking photographs and chatting, then the ushers are fighting in between. When the, when the choristers meet, not that they are fighting with one another and the pastors are not divided and the elders are consumed with their own things. But when we come and we are one, I tell you, there is nothing that will be impossible. If, oh. When we get to that place, well, when on the road you are sitting, the man on the fourth place, you have a problem with him. But because you came to the house of God, you are forgiving him. Because Jesus said, when you are bringing your fruit to the altar or your sacrifice there, and you remember that you have ought against any, and any has ought against you. So it's not just you who has ought against somebody, but somebody has ought against you both ways. Solve it. When we get to that place, that we can solve our problems. Amen. I tell you, things will happen. Oh, when we come to that place where you are sitting down and you are hearing me preach. You are not saying that. And you are believing God that today, God, let it be my day. When we come to that place and you are coming to church and you are coming, you know that in the house of God, there is a solution. I tell you, all things will be possible. May God. Yes, if you want to clap, do it well. May God lead us and guide us to that place where the anointing of God will work for us. Because if the anointing is what gives us tangible results this month, may the anointing of God work for you. This month, may whatever was impossible in your life become possible. This month, may what the doctor said cannot be cured in your life, may it be cured. This month, may that barrenness be corrected. May that miscarriage be corrected. This month, may that situation with your marriage, may it be healed. This man, may that situation with your business, may it be transformed. May God give you the victory, the insight you need to get the success in the exam you have been writing and you have always had a problem. May this month bring a turning point in your life. Bow down your head. Let us pray.
as your heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you are here today, if your sins have not been forgiven, the anointing cannot work for you. And I'm here to pray with you for every sin in your life to be forgiven. If you are here today and you want God to forgive you your sins whilst our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, lift up one hand, I'm going to pray with you. You will never be the same. You want your sins forgiven. Yes, you want your sins forgiven. Lift up your hand. Yes, thank you. You want your sins forgiven. You want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Take your Bible, your bag, your purse. Walk to me in front here. You will never be the same. You want your sins forgiven. Take your Bible, your bag, your purse. Walk to me in front here. I want to pray with you. You want your sins forgiven today. Yes, will you lift up one hand? Church, lift up one hand. Pray this prayer with me. If you are watching by television, listening by radio, also pray this prayer with me. Will you say, dear God, forgive me all my sins. Lord Jesus, you died for me. You rose for me. Come into my life. Make my life a testimony. To those who know me, Thank you, Lord. Answered prayer. In Jesus' name. Put your hand on your chest. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for these ones. I pray that they will know you and know you better. I pray you establish them in your house. I pray you do a new work in their lives. Satan, lose your hold over God's property. Let them go free. In Jesus' name, amen.